like to begin by thanking the Manchester Community Library for welcoming us here in this space. Thank you, too, to GNAT TV for running the live stream feature and videotaping this program. And a special thanks to Audubon Vermont and Merck Forest and Farmland Center for partnering with us on this program. We have another program on Saturday, March 30th, that is a good follow-up to today. Tim will take us on a field walk at Owl Prowl at Merck Forest from 5.30 to 7 on March 30th. Um, March is owl breeding season, so the late day timing of this walk is in aims of increasing our chances of encountering an owl. Participants can expect to spend one and a half hours outside looking for owls and exploring the concepts of bird habitat along the way. Space is limited, and we currently have, I think, three spots available. Um, if interested, please register on our website. Next Tuesday, we have economist Peter Radford, who will talk about the, the election year economy, facts and issues. This is on March 26th, and it's 5.30 here in the library and also online. Please silence your cell phones. And during Q&A, we will have a microphone pass, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the mic to come to you. And for those online, please type your questions in the chat feature, and Liz will monitor that. Our guest is a native Vermonter with a Bachelor of Science from the University of Vermont and a Master's of Science from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His passion for conservation extends back to his teenage years spent at the Green Mountain Conservation Camps. In time since, he has worked with birds in almost every role he has held in his career. He is the Forest Program Ecologist with Audubon Vermont and Audubon lead of the Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers program. He resides in Dorset, Vermont. Please give a warm welcome to Tim Dulo. Well, thank you, Gloria, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for the Manchester Community Library for hosting us and GNAT for streaming us. Uh, I'm going to do my best to talk at the right distance from the microphone. This is kind of a new, not a new, but a somewhat different platform than simply presenting from my, my home office on Zoom. So it's even more exciting for that reason. So thank you all for coming out. Uh, I intend to talk for upwards of about maybe up to an hour. I've got a lot to talk about tonight and we're gonna have plenty of space at the end for questions and answers and wherever discussions go among us. So thank you all and without further ado. So uh, Gloria, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I kind of probably could have skipped past this because you already did such a good introduction. But yes, I, I, kind of, I grew up in, in the state of Vermont. Uh, I've always been interested in forest ecology, conservation in the state. Uh, I've been fortunate to work with our own Fish and Wildlife Department, as well as our National Wildlife Refuge Systems, uh, Vermont Center for Eco Studies, which is kind of the, the main <coughs> research arm um, or entity, I should say, in the state of Vermont outside of the University of Vermont. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate to be able to do a lot of different things in my career leading up to this point that have taken me um, all over. And it's really been the last 10 years or more that I've become very interested in birds in particular and thinking about climate change, forest ecology, uh, and now in my role with Audubon Vermont, how we steward our forests in Vermont for the benefit of birds and greater biodiversity. So tonight I'm going to talk about Audubon Vermont, which is a part of the National Audubon Society. So slightly different than the county chapters that we've got um, across Vermont. I'm going to talk about the core of the work I do under the Healthy Forest Program at Audubon Vermont here. So much of my talk tonight will be delivering on uh, what I think about in my position and thinking about forest bird needs across the state of Vermont uh, and what we as landowners, decision makers can do to influence the Vermont forested landscape now and going forward for the benefit of birds but also for the benefit of biodiversity, as well as a lot of other co-benefits that come with managing our forests in these ways for biodiversity. I'm also gonna talk a bit kind of towards the end, after I talk about forests, I'm gonna talk about 
the, the yard and the space around your house and how to kind of incorporate some of the same concepts that we think about in terms of forest habitat in your yard as well. Uh, I'm going to throw out a bunch of resources as well. Hopefully everybody here will leave with a greater understanding about forest birds needs, the state of forest birds in the state of Vermont, but also a thing or two about what you could do uh, to learn more and you yourself be the best stewards you can be for our birds in whatever spaces you occupy and affect. And then we will have a discussion towards the end, or at the end rather. Cool. So as I mentioned, I um, work for the National Audubon Society, which has um, a state chapter here in Vermont, Audubon Vermont, which is different from, let's say, like Massachusetts, which has Mass Audubon. The state comes before the name. Um, they do very similar work to us, but they're not beholden to the National Audubon Society, which is a state, or excuse me, a national level organization. We have about 700 employees nationally. We've got folks that work in you know, digital marketing. Uh, we have folks that work in research, folks that work with landowners such as myself. We have educators. We have a lot of folks um, on staff. And uh, here in Vermont, we have a pretty small team of about 10 folks that work across the state. I'm one of four biologists that work in on the Healthy Lands program. And so uh, the mission, the, excuse me, the mission of Audubon is to protect the places um, that birds need today and tomorrow. And so everything I do falls under that overarching mission. Specific to here in Vermont, uh, in our Healthy Forest program, kind of the, the main tenets of our program uh, are, are, as you see here. So first and foremost, uh, our main objective is to keep forests as forests. Um, so that, that is to say that we are looking to avoid deforestation and loss of our forests. And we're also trying to maintain these forests along large, contiguous, well, in and of themselves, contiguous large blocks of forests, but maintain connectivity but, um, between these forest blocks. And all of this work really falls under uh, a much larger effort that the state of Vermont has kind of established uh, under Vermont conservation design. Uh, and now, you know, we're thinking about the 30 by 30 bill and 50 by 50, um, Act 59, and uh, how to enact Vermont conservation design. Uh, so we very much ourselves and with our partners are working under this model of trying to maintain these large connected forested lands across the state. And I work with land managers, such as landowners, in thinking about these things. I work with policymakers in thinking about these things, uh, foresters, and um, pretty much anybody that has a role in affecting forests in Vermont. Uh, I do a bit of technical assistance through our Woods Wildlife and Warblers program, where I go out on landowners' properties. I'll walk their forest with them, and I'll interpret pretty much everything I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, but for them directly in, in terms of their forest and what they have. I also will work with their forester if they have one in thinking about how to incorporate these concepts into management planning. Uh, I also work on training for professional foresters themselves and deploying them to work with these landowners. That's kind of a newer program that I'm working to develop. Uh, as I mentioned, I also do a bit of policy-based um, analysis and input across the state. I work with young folks like the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps to support forest management work in their development. We also have some demonstration forests, one of which is at Merck Forest and Farmland Center, uh, as well as other, other parts of the state. The really cool thing about birds, and I, I kind of picked up on this in my undergrad years, and I'm, it's, it's awesome that it's kind of built into this, is that you know birds are just, uh, they hit so many marks in terms of getting people to think about uh, being stewards, um, you know, uh, the needs of forests and how to manage forests or really just protect, take care of forests. Uh, birds themselves are great indicators of forest health. Um, they're charismatic. And really when you manage for birds, and the needs of birds, I should say, through, and I don't want to cut to the chase because I'm going to talk all about this, but along the way, when you do things that help birds, you also increase the resiliency of forests through climate change. 
also typically stimulates gr growth and stimulate, or I should say greater sequestration of carbon storage of carbon, which is uh, a very big area of focus right now. Um, and also there, it also can be very well compatible with continuing to procure forest pro products off the land and um, other use of forests. Birding in and of itself is a huge industry. Um, and these are very large numbers. I'm talking $80 billion from, for, from watching wildlife. Uh, and um, you know, the amount of money, time people take to travel to see birds, uh, learn about birds, the equipment they buy. So you know, in and of itself, birding is very much a serious business. Um, and uh, it, uh, it gives me a job to do as well. <laughs> uh, Birds in and of themselves, they're important for the, the ecosystem, the, the forest ecosystem. Um, no doubt, you know, don't need to say there's a lot of different types of birds out there that live in a lot of different environments. Tonight we're talking about forests. Uh, within the forest, you know, birds eat a lot of insects. So in and of themselves, uh, they are great natural pest control, let's say. They work to maintain a bit of equilibrium in our ecosystem. It's a very common bird, forest bird in Vermont, the red-eyed vireo. They'll sing all day long at the top of the tree, even in the heat of the day when other birds are uh, trying to save their, their energy and, and hang out in the cooler shade. Um, we also have, we have one hummingbird in Vermont, the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, which is most commonly found in the yard, I'd say, over the forest, but it's an example of a bird that is a pollinator. So, we have, you know, birds also help with plant, uh, uh, plant reproduction. They also help with plant reproduction in that they consume and disperse seeds across the ecosystem. These are cedar waxwings, a very common bird here in Vermont. Um, my partner, my wife is a sea patrol at Stratton, and they have been all over the top of Stratton this year eating the mountain ash that have so many, um, it was a big, big mass year, so a lot of fruit on mountain ash, so they're, they've been up there all winter, and they'll probably be, no doubt, down here eating your berries off of your hawthorn trees and whatnot. And in, in that same vein, they help with nutrient cycling throughout the ecosystem as well. Um, this is a white-breasted nuthatch, a very common bird, resident bird. It sticks around all year long uh, here in the yard. We have one other nuthatch, a uh, red-breasted nuthatch, that also uh, occupies more coniferous forests. Um, a very common feeder bird right here. So across all of the different birds that occupy forest ecosystems, they all, they all, they all use different parts of that forest. They all have different habitat needs. I'll talk about what I mean by habitat and how you define it. But, you know, it can be very generally and accurately said that um, the diversity of birds that you have in your landscape or specifically in the forest is a direct reflection of the richness of that forest habitat. And so this right here is kind of the, the main uh, focus of my work and the message that I bring to landowners and the message that I'm hopefully going to deliver tonight. Vermont in and of itself really is a bird breeding factory. So uh, here on this illustration, what you're seeing is a color map that is displaying the number of individual bird species that are detected um, along these annual survey routes, these breeding bird survey routes, um, which is uh, North America's longest uh, ongoing survey, consistent survey of um, breeding birds. And you can just see that Vermont is like the whole like um, Appalachian mountain range and um, northern forest region is, is very high. So we have a lot, of, a lot of birds here in this region relative to, to others, uh, other parts of uh, North America. And in fact, when you look at uh, the, those same data, as well as others from eBird, and kind of correlate them geographically, you see that 
uh, our forest locks, the ones I showed uh, in my earlier slide from Vermont Conservation Design, they really match up. And in this way, uh, these large forest locks are uh, very significant in terms of the number of species that they host and the species they host, both residents and migrants that go um, all the way from, you know, southern part of the U.S. or down to South America. And then when you look at the different groups of species of birds, whether they're shrubland birds or grassland birds or forest birds, here it's, it's from the same study, the same data, uh, just shown in a different way. And forest habitat itself does have a lot more birds um, species of birds than the others. So all of this is building towards the fact, making the case that our forests are very important relative to other parts of the US in terms of the number of species we have, and they're, they're important and unique in the number of species they have relative to other parts of Vermont, other ecosystems in Vermont. And the last um, kind of Vermont specific data figure I'll show here, um, is from the Breeding Bird Survey of Vermont. We've had two iterations of this survey, 25 years apart, whereby uh, at all these locations across the state of Vermont, birders have gone out and done repeat surveys to see how the species community has changed across those 25 years. And when you put all this together, uh, we have about 80 species of birds that depend on some for form of forest habitat, whether it's intact interior forest or even like some shrub and, you know, shrubby stuff that grows along your yard or in, in the, you know, along the stream edge. I know this is just a, a list of bird names, but uh, just to convey uh, kind of a, a core group of those 80, these are 40 species that uh, have the core of their breeding distribution here in Vermont. Oh yes, you can take photos of, of slides if you want along the way. Um, there's actually gonna be slides later on where there's QR codes, so you can like take a photo of it and then uh, we can talk about in discussion how to use the QR code. But um, yeah, so feel free to take photos. Uh, you know, we've got, um, we've got some pretty unique habitat in Vermont terms are high elevation for real forest habitat. Uh, I, I'll, I'm just gonna elevate probably one of my favorite bird species, the Bicknell's thrush which is one of the rarest birds in North America that uh, holds its, its, some of its core and greatest breeding habitat here in Vermont at the very top of our mountains. Um, and, you know, our mountain birds in particular, uh, there's only a handful of them, but they are very imperiled by climate change and um, very much worth our consideration. Northern hardwood species, Several of the species I'm going to, or on this list rather, I'm going to talk about a little bit later because they're kind of uh, focal birds for conservation through my program. Um, but all told, these are the 40 species that we think, uh, or we focus a lot on just because there are, there are core species here in Vermont. And to break it down to just 12 species, these are the birders dozen. So Audubon Vermont re recognizes that, you know, it's, it's a lot to, to memorize, come to understand all these different birds. And so what we've done is we've selected 12 species that are relatively straightforward to identify. They're unique. They are high priority birds in terms of the fact that Vermont's very important for them. And they each individually uh, require a, a unique component, habitat component, that if we manage for each of these species together, Altogether, they, they, they offer the suite of habitat conditions that the other birds need. So they're basically like representatives of so much more. If you take care of these birds, you take care of the other ones as well. We have uh, certain birds, like I can just go around from top, you know, um, clockwise here. The scarlet tanager focuses on that high canopy forest, deciduous bird, brilliantly um, red thus its name, uh, Eastern Wood Kiwi, which uh, is a, um, it's a fly catcher. It really likes canopy gaps. So that space that remains after an individual tree falls over or is taken over, uh, they like to sit on the edge of those and they, they, they'll spot insects and fly in and pick those insects off. 
Uh, we have got the blue headed vireo here, number six, which is uh, a conifer species. It, really, it likes those evergreens in our forests. Uh, we've got the wood thrush, which is one of our um, four thrush species in Vermont. Technically, probably have five, but uh, wood thrush is a, a representative of what we call that mid-story uh, layer, that layer of forest that exists above head height and up to about 30 feet tall. Uh, so they, they nest, they forage in that, in that layer of the forest. The yellow belly sapsucker, which needs these standing dead trees that are very important um, for other cavity nesting birds as well. Uh, chestnut sided warbler is our poster child for young forest habitat. What we call like early successional habitat, shrubby stuff. Um, it's a brilliantly just beautiful bird. Um, pretty common, I guarantee that most of you will, all of you have an opportunity, fun opportunity to hear it this summer. American Woodcock, they showed up at my house maybe three weeks ago, I'd say. So they're back, just like the song sparrows are back, uh, much to their chagrin that it snowed like <laughs> so much. Um, Red-winged blackbirds are back as well, so they're coming back. Uh, so, and, and the Woodcock are like old field obligates. They really like uh, abandoned fields with, uh, you know, some basically you can envision like an abandoned farm, you know, some sh woody shrub shrub veg and uh, some grasses and forbs and stuff. A white-throated sparrow, which is pretty much a generalist. It, it, uh, you can be found that one at the very top of our mountain all the way down to the bottom, uh, val the valley floor rather. They really like that shrub layer along the understory, as, as does the viri. Uh, another shrub layer, understory layer bird, understory being the, the forest uh, vegetation that grows from the bottom of the forest, or along, from the forest floor up to head height. Uh, Canada Warbler here with the spectacles at number 12. They really like um, that shrubby conifer layer along that under that forest floor as well as down deadwood. All of these components we'll talk more about uh, later in our presentation. And the last two are the black-throated green warbler, which is number 10. Another conifer obligate, kind of like those tall conifer trees. And then the black throated blue warbler, which is very much dependent on that understory layer. So again, birders dozen, these are all birds that you can find here in this part of Vermont during the breeding season. Some of them are resident, some of them are migrant, meaning they go far away and then they return in the summer, um, being gone in the winter. And if you manage your forest in ways that meet the needs of each of them, you can manage your forest for so much more than just these 12. I'm gonna talk so much more about that later. Um, before I do, I'm gonna talk a bit about forest bird decline, state of the population, and some of the factors <coughs> affecting um, our forest bird community. And so, um, yeah, we've lost a lot of birds in the last uh, 50 years. Um, you know, up to 60% of our wood thrush, a lot of our migrant birds, our insectivorous birds in particular, have, have rapidly declined. Um, just a couple weeks ago, I saw the State of the Forest Birds report uh, come out from Mountain Bird Watch. Uh, and just in the last 10 years, we've lost like 60% of seven out of eight species. And that's really tough. Um, but this is why we do what we do and are doing what we're doing. Um, here in Vermont, uh, same entity that runs the Mountain Bird Watch program, Vermont Center for Eco Studies. They've been monitoring birds for a long time in forests across Vermont. And here again, we're seeing a decline in forest birds. Some of that very well could be changes in particular study sites themselves, but it correlates with what we're seeing at a much larger scale as well. That breeding bird survey that I referenced earlier, uh, we've, you know, 25 years later, after the first survey, we see major turnover in the forest, or excuse me, the bird species that uh, are found at particular sites. Uh, we've seen, you know, in some cases, species coming into certain sites, sites where they weren't before, in other cases, they've departed. 
And again, here we're seeing at the Vermont scale what we're seeing at a larger, you know, beyond Vermont scale, which is our aerial insectivores in particular are declining uh, quite fast. Just a lot of our, our thrushes and most, most all of our birds are insectivorous in large or small capacity. So causes of forest bird decline. Uh, forest habitat loss and fragmentation is one I think about a lot. And that really underpins what I do and what we're talking about tonight. Uh, as is reduced forest habitat quality, I'm going to talk a, a bit in a moment about what I mean by that and why, that's, why that is. Climate change is also uh, having a, a substantial effect upon our, our bird communities in many direct and indirect ways. As I already mentioned, we're seeing such a decline in our insect diverse birds, and that correlates with the decline in insects themselves. Um, Non-native invasive pests and plants are also a problem. I think a lot about invasive plants, we'll talk about that, and then disease outbreaks as well. It's a lot to put out there. It's important to, to know, but we're focusing on the solutions, not just the problems. Uh, so very briefly, um, forest habitat loss and fragmentation. Uh, you know, we lose about 10,000 acres of forest a year here in Vermont to development. Uh, you know, which I, I'm not making a comment either way on the need to house folks. That's very important. Um, but regardless, the phenomena does exist. We're losing land. And I, I will pause and say this is not losing land to logging or forestry. Um, this, is, this is, which isn't the case at all, but this is development, land use, change, and conversion. Um, on the forest habitat quality side, something that I feel like uh, a lot of folks don't quite appreciate, or at least I didn't appreciate for a long time, is that really not that long ago, Vermont was like deforested. You know, 150 plus years ago, in the mid 18th century, Vermont cut down almost all of its trees. Uh, and in fact, today, we only have about a half percent of forests in Vermont that remain from before that time. So we only have about a half percent true old growth forests existing in Vermont. And so in forest time, you know, the 1850s wasn't that long ago. And so we, had, we have relatively young forests in Vermont, we call teenage forests. And for that reason, uh, our forests in Vermont are relatively simple, not complex. You know, they're, they're not the old forests that existed before. And so I think a lot about how we are, have a, a need and opportunity to restore our forests in certain situations to old forest conditions, the conditions that existed before. Uh, just today, I got this cool photo from the, the uh, Manchester Historical Society. I saw that an individual is giving a talk, right, on maps. I reached out to him. Uh, and this is a, a photo from the top of Mount Equinox from 1809. Um, and I'll be honest, I was surprised at how much forest did exist kind of in the, the background of the 1800, or excuse me, the 1908 numbers mixed up there, 1908 photo. But certainly you can see in the valley how much forest, less forest there was in, in 1908 in Manchester versus today. Um, so just to illustrate that our forests have very much grown back and are continuing to grow back. Climate change uh, in and of itself, we are looking at and experiencing increased temperature and precipitation. Uh, which is changing the what we call the climate uh, niche or niche that uh, birds occupy. And it's a bit of the research I've done uh, is is has focused on looking at that the degree to which climate influences where birds live and how many of them are there. Uh, that's changing. We're also seeing an increase in the. The, the frequency and magnitude of these extreme events, you know, not too long ago we were talking about 100 year floods that we're now seeing every decade, if not, you know, more, more uh, frequent than that, like the one we had in July this past summer. Right now, we're experiencing, a, even just the last couple of weeks, some crazy weather, false springs, uh, which is leading to what we call phenolo phenological mismatch, whereby, you know, the rains we had Three weeks ago, 
two weeks ago, I got an inch and a half of rain at my house in Dorset, and it was 50, 55 degrees out, which those two in combination are the conditions that trigger our amphibians to come out of hibernation. And then two days later, it was freezing and it snowed. And so I have hoped that not all of our amphibians, I don't think not all of our amphibians are triggered to come out, probably just some of them based upon microclimate. But that's an example of an ecological trap where by conditions are fluctuating in ways that animals are tricked into making themselves, vul themselves vulnerable um, when uh, they otherwise were not. Um, and then, you know, you think about a bird trying to travel 2,000 plus miles to its wintering grounds. It has to navigate hurricanes, has to navigate changes in land use along the way, which that's not climate change, but that's a fact. Um, and so it just, this climate change is just, um, it's a real challenge in many ways. Um, and things are, things are just really changing. I could, I could spend all, my entire talk just talking about this, but uh, it's so much more than this. Um, and then just briefly, my work in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, I basically studied, I, I counted birds going from the bottom of the mountain very up to the very top of the mountain, all across the White Mountain National Forest and the Presidentials, looking at you know, the degree to which certain species only live in the floor, the, the floor, the valley floor versus like mid elevation or the very top of the mountain. And then looking at the forest type that they lived in, the temperature and precipitation that kind of, um, you know, they experienced in that space where they lived. And, and I, my work sought to tease apart the degree to which birds are where they are because, because the temperature is a certain way versus is it the forest that is the reason why that bird is in that spot or is it both? Um, because, and it gets complicated, but basically climate is changing faster than forests can keep up. So if birds are tracking one over the other or any combination, you know, very well we could be looking at a decoupling of what birds need in terms of the right climate in the right forest condition. In fact, my research did find that um, it is a complicated relationship, but there is a relationship between temperature, precipitation, climate, and birds, and between birds and their forests. And so what this gets at is thinking about things like this, where we can model how birds are going to potentially change based upon changes in temperature. And here you're looking at how the wood thrush very well could be track could track its ideal temperature condition as that goes more north, um, but in the case of this, it doesn't take into account the, the the role that forests play in defining the habitat that this bird needs. So if the forests don't keep up with the the temperature conditions this bird is adapted to, this bird's going to be in a tough spot. So that's a lot of what I think about. I know this is really science heavy. We're going to get into the forests um, and more tangible at home stuff here in a moment. Um, without further ado, I, to set the stage, five elements of habitat that define, um, def, def, define habitat for any organism is food, so what they need to eat is water, we all need to drink, shelter, we need to be able to, to stay undercover and out of the elements, and then the space that exists between a uh, really space is thinking about um, the space each individual needs free of competition from others um, and then arrangement. So I think what I'm going to present next for the rest of my, my talk tonight is thinking about these five elements of habitat together and making sure that we can provide those elements of habitat across the raw landscape at, in our backwoods and then in our yard. Um, and it really is something to think about across multiple scales, uh, all the way from the landscape down to your, your backyard, <laughs> which I'll talk about. So at the first level, what can we do to help our birds? And the first and foremost thing we can do, which gets back to like my first and second slide, is maintain forests as forests across Vermont, right? Um, and so this is where, again, I think a lot about Vermont conservation design. 
and the, the way in which we can all, you know, all being like all citizens of Vermont, but also all of our nonprofits, state and federal partners, entities can all work towards the same goal. And here, I, I just, I can, Vermont, is, it's got a lot going for it that a lot of other states don't. And Vermont Conservation Design is one. Uh, and here, Vermont Conservation Design has identified these, these high priority existing forest blocks that occur across the state, the connectivity between those blocks, and has set targets for retention of old forest uh, conditions that exist. Um, not necessarily old growth forests, which that's a given that we're going to maintain our old growth forests, but old forests, but also some young forests because we do have some bird species, for example, that really need young forests. Um, and really, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in one of my favorite analogies right now, which is trying to think about all this kind of like a financial investment portfolio. It's like, how do I... How do I maintain a diversity of conditions so that I'm minimizing my risk and, and maximizing my gains, I guess, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's, it's not about one size fits all or, you know, one type of habitat is the be all end all. It's like, how do we just maintain a diversity of it all and maintain it in a way that it's, it's functional, it's functional, it's connected. Um, so diversity, diversity, diversity is extremely important. And realizing that in the case of the birds, uh, for example, thinking about that arrangement, that space, you know, a certain species of bird, like the golden winged warbler, for example, exists in the Champlain Valley, and it's kind of a unique bird, but it, it, that one in the wood thrush, for example, they, they, they do what's known as patch trading, where they, they like to, or they need to nest and fledge young, or I should say nest and hatch young in a certain habitat, whether it's forest or shrubland, but then to continue to raise their young, they need to be able to have close by either mature forest or shrubland. So, which is just tells the story that for certain birds, we need these things all connected. Um, and again, I think about it as like, you know, how do we maintain it as a mosaic across the Vermont landscape? Think about Vermont conservation design, for example. And then how do we maintain it at, let's say, township level, and then on your own land? And here, in thinking about it on your own land, I, I'm really, I, I feel like I've come into this body of work at, at a, a great time because uh, what I'm seeing is, is such a shift from, from thinking about forest management. Specifically, I'm talking here about forestry, silviculture, which is the art and science of, of growing trees, basically forestry. Like we're at an age where we're starting to move away from thinking about, you know, just maximizing production of forests for the sake of forest products. And we're thinking more and more in the sciences about what we call ecological silviculture, which is how do we manage uh, forest ecosystems in ways through forestry, uh, sometimes logging, uh, that emulate natural processes, nat especially like natural disturbance processes that uh, maintain or can improve the ecological function of that forest. And here, relating back to what I mentioned earlier, which is a lot of Vermont's forests, the vast majority of the Vermont's forests are quite young and simple. And I feel that we're in an age of trying to restore Vermont's forests back to these older forest conditions that existed before we cut down all the trees. And so ecological silviculture is, is gaining momentum. I'm really excited about that. And it's actually gaining momentum by some of, uh, I mean, the leading scientists that are here in Vermont, like Tony D'Amato is up at UVM. Um, Audubon Vermont has also put together uh, a guide for landowners in how to think about ecological forestry on their own property. And this is the body of work that I lead, uh, doing technical assistance with landowners, walking their land with them, and interpreting what I see, specifically, you know, largely through the birders does in here. Uh, it's also what I'm working to train professional foresters in 
so that they can bring that to their clients and keep spreading the good work. Uh, ideally, we're going to get to a point where I can recommend specific foresters that have gone through our training to landowners. We've got a couple of foresters through the program, but I'm still building it up. So again, I, I feel like I've already talked earlier about this, so I won't spend too much on this, this one, but again, it's, it's thinking about all of these components together, these five elements of habitat. And visually, it's, in many cases, it's not uncommon to see a forest like this in Vermont, relatively even aged. You see the trees are all about the same size, more or less. Um, you know, there's, there's largely, I do have a pointer here. I mean, we've got these sugar maples, and then we've got kind of like a second cohort or age of sugar maples coming up, but we don't really have any understory, right? We've got some ferns and whatnot, um, but there's no shrubs growing along the understory, which is fairly common in Vermont for a couple different reasons. Uh, and so in this forest type, all those birds that need that understory layer are missing out. There's also not a whole lot in terms of branching and structure along that mid-story. It's all really kind of in that overstory. So a very simple forest condition, a young forest here in Vermont. And ideally, we move things towards this, like a much more complex forest, right? Where you have you know, that understory vegetation layer, you've got mid-story growing up, and you've got overstory. <coughs> ideally, at least like three age classes of trees. Um, and this, this looks much more like an older growth forest than this one. The same folks I mentioned at UVM, uh, Tony D'Amato and UMass Paul Cantanzaro, they, they've also recently thrown out this guide and restoring old forest characteristics to uh, our forests. And it's amazing that this guide is out now. And again, it's just fueling us trying to think about how we restore all these conditions to Vermont's forests. Uh, and those conditions are canopy gaps. I'm sorry, well, <laughs> and so yeah, canopy gaps. I mentioned that, uh, you know, like the um, Eastern Wood Peewee, for example, or flycatchers, they, they need these, these openings where like a tree has, you know, broken off and fallen over, or it was cut over, you know, cut down for firewood or whatnot. And this resulting canopy, uh, this opening is a place where they can hunt. And also that canopy opens up sunlight so that, or it, it allows sunlight to come down, penetrate to the forest floor and stimulate regeneration and growth of that understory, which those other birds need. So forest disturbance here in this example uh, serves to increase the complexity of our forest. We also want to maintain a, a component of large diameter trees. This one, this tree, uh, you could almost, I mean, who's to say for sure, but we also have trees that we call like wolf trees. Um, I believe it was Tom Wessels that, uh, in his reading The Forest of Landscape, maybe he coined that term, but basically, if you walk through the forest of Vermont, it's not uncommon to find these large sugar maples, especially, uh, that remain, that typically exist along old fence lines, uh, stone walls and whatnot. <laughs> these trees were saved from being cut down in the 1800s. Um, but these, these trees, in addition to storing a lot of carbon, have cavities, places for um, critters of all varieties, including birds, to, to, to live. Uh, and eventually they turn into these standing dead trees, which we call snags in the business. Um, and so just retaining large diameter trees, as well as these cavity trees, these snags are tremendously important. Uh, and it's, it's not uncommon to, for folks to cut their snags down as firewood or to just remove them as basic practice in forest management. And I advocate against that. Um, kind of already talked about legacy trees, but uh, again, um, well here, you know, this large <coughs> black um, cherry it's pretty magnificent, and it uh, eventually will turn into a snag, but in the time being, it's, it's also produ producing some fruit, uh, cherry trees being a, both a wood product and a, a tree that produces some fruit in the forest. And as I already mentioned, 
you know, we want forests that have many age classes uh, and species, as well as species diversity as well. We don't want to manage or just, not necessarily just manage, but like we just, ideally we don't have forests that are just comprised of a single tree species. We want as much diversity in our forests as possible, especially in thinking about, uh, you know, a changing climate and the fact that, uh, back to the investment portfolio analogy, we have certain trees in Vermont that are positioned to do better in a changing climate, and we have certain species of trees growing in Vermont that are predicted to not do as well. And so the greater diversity of spe tree species we have in our forests, the greater habitat that will exist for forest birds, but also the greater resilience that your forest will have to climate change. And same with having different ages of trees, young trees that are more resilient to old trees and whatnot. So all of this comes down to, again, diversity, diversity, diversity. And then messy is also good. So there's something about human psychology that uh, myself included that is attracted to uniformity and cleanliness. Um, but when it comes to habitat, down dead wood, brush piles, um, debris, you know, wreckage from windstorms, all of that is good for birds. Um, and, uh, and so whether it's just letting the forest be, or if you do have like a forest harvest operation, uh, like a timber harvest that just happened, ask the, the operator of the logger to leave everything in the woods. Don't cut the, the, the brush down, don't lop stuff, just leave it as it is. Um, Cause all of this provides you know, uh, habitat for insects, which the birds will eat. It provides cover for some certain birds, drumming logs for rough grouse. Um, you know, it's it's keeping carbon in the woods as well. And then also thinking about beyond the trees, the amount of herbaceous cover, or uh, shall I say, like you know, fruiting fruiting tree or fruiting species. Uh, one of my favorite species of woody plants is the hobble bush, which is a kind of, you see it a lot in the mountains and it gets its name because you hobble through it, right? If you've been out, well, it's not a great skiing here, but you know, it's, you see it a lot when you're out in the glades <laughs> um, on the slopes, but either way, hobble bush is a great example of key, uh, you know, black bird blue warbler pretty much specialized on hobble bush and yet it goes overlooked and under considered when we talk about how we take care of the forest. So I'd love to, to highlight hobble bush, but also, you know, other fruit bearing species like raspberries, blackberries, elderberries, um, you know, winterberry, dogwoods, all of those, those species uh, offer important soft mass and food for, for birds and wildlife. Um, and, and notably, we do have invasive plants that uh, offer fruit as well, but they tend to, the fruit tends to be like junk food. So think about like the buckthorn and the um, barberry and honeysuckle, fruit bearing species, but kind of junk food. And I'll talk more about basic plants in the yard section in a moment. And so uh, I feel free to take a snapshot of this slide. Uh, there's a lot of entities out there to help you think about these things. I'm one of them here at Audubon, Vermont, in our Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers program. Uh, but our partners at the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation, they're great to reach out to to think about cons connecting with a consulting forester or um, you know, think about forest management. Department of Fish and Wildlife is a a powerful agency in Vermont. They've got a lot of great resources out there. Um, all of these entities have something to offer landowners in thinking about forest birds uh, and what, what to do. And at the very bottom, ourvermontwoods.org is, is an effort that we put forth to kind of combine all of these resources together. So if you, follow, if you go to that, that website, you'll be able to find pretty much everything that I could ever offer up here in terms of follow-up um, resource guide. So now that we've very much covered forests, I wanted to cover yards, right? And your backyard, because your backyard is just as important as your forest. Um, 
Thank you, Google, for getting me such a great photo of, um, I forget what I searched for, but basically, you know, beautiful yard, right? Um, great grass, what a monoculture. So uniform, I love it, right? Um, but if I was a bird, I would probably prefer this. Um, messy is good, right? And so basically, if you take anything away, maybe not to not to put anything down about this, but maybe try to move away from this to, to more like just that. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, right off the bat, um, to kind of you know put it together, it's, it's the same concepts as in the woods, more or less. Uh, you know, it's thinking about how to retain snags. You know, um, of course, there's a potentially a safety concern in having a snag over your yard. I would you know, never advise against taking safety first, but again, that snag that you might previously have thought of as a visual blight is actually like a really important habitat. Uh, also thinking about maintaining shrubs along your, the edge of your yard in whatever, you know, form your yard takes or your, your property takes. Uh, thinking about how to, again, maintain diversity of different plant species, some of which offer better cover, others offer fruit. Uh, and in thinking about what you plant or promote, very much not promoting, I'm not promoting invasive plants. There are uh, about 40 invasive plants known to Vermont. Uh, Vermont has banned the uh, import, the sale, distribution of known invasive plants, which is awesome. Um, but definitely, prioritize native plants in, in what you plant in your yard. Uh, think about maintaining some water, water features. Uh, um, you know, even if it's just like a little like water bath. Um, maintaining those canopy trees and just, again, structural diversity in your yard. Trying to, trying to maintain something more than just a, a monoculture. Uh, trying to avoid using uh, pesticides in your yard. Um, Pesticides have really been the cause of, of or the cause of our insect population decline in Vermont. Um, and Audubon Vermont and others are working very hard to pass a bill to ban neonet neonectoids um, for them for the birds. So again, thinking about the comp components of food, water, shelter, space, and assembly in your yard. Um, and then, you know, again, thinking about like shrubs and maybe like some fields behind your house. Another thing I, I, I tend to uh, frequently kind of uh, guide people on is just thinking about maintaining more of what we call soft edge, where that field, uh, whether it's a grassland, a yard, or kind of a, you know, a brushy area, trying to maintain a gradual transition between that open area to your forest. So maybe thinking about not brush hogging or cutting right up to the forest, but leading like a 15 foot strip around it where you allow like kind of more of that shrubby stuff to grow up. And some of our young forest species will actually nest in there and whatnot. Um, I also, I also um, suggest that folks think about delay mowing. Uh, if you have a space that you typically brush on just to keep it from reverting back to forest, maybe you just mow it in late October before the snow falls, after you know all the birds have moved on and all the pollinators and insects are done, or you just mow it every every other year, you know, before all the before it completely gets taken over by woody vegetation. And basic plants pretty much already suffice to say uh, they, you know, it's no fault of their own. They are just plants out of place that are from a different part of the world and they tend to take over and they uh, reduce biodiversity. And so I'm very much an advocate for being aware of what invasive plants exist and trying to avoid uh, any invasive plants um, growing on your property if possible. VTinvasives.org is an excellent resource for thinking about invasive plants and what to do about them. Some other quick tips are thinking about putting up bird boxes, right? So, uh, you know, nestwatch.org, uh, if, I, if I may uh, promote Cornell partners, 
Uh, they've got excellent resource in terms of thinking about different nest box construction designs, bluebirds. I've got a couple bluebird boxes at my house um, and, and where to place them, how to take care of them. Thinking about winter time specifically, we do need to be conscientious of bears and the fact that bears love bird feeders, but in the winter time, uh, bird feeders can be a great, a great thing to get your birds. And believe it or not, there's a variety of different bird feeders that exist for a variety of different birds. Uh, and you know, I still, I still got some suet out uh, myself and a bird feeder out, which I'll take in soon. Um, but it's just a, it's an excellent way to uh, give your your birds a boost up in the winter time, and then also get to see seabirds and you know maybe start a list of birds that you have. Um, so feederwatch.org is a great resource. They also Cornell also has um, a monitoring program where you can submit observations of the birds that you see. Oh, I will note that with bird feeders comes the responsibility of cleaning those bird feeders on a, on a you know somewhat frequent basis with some soap water mild bleach solution. Window strikes, birds are a threat. Um, you know, it, it's, it's worth noting, if you do have issues with birds hitting your windows, you can think about rearranging the room such that they're maybe, maybe they're seeing like a, a plant, a potted plant that they think they can like, you yeah. know, perch on and so maybe move that. Uh, out of the window so it's not so obvious or attractive. Uh, folks have gone as far as to put up like, you know, some decals or visual um, kind of things that help <coughs> tell the bird that there's actually a, a, a wall there, a window. And then lastly, uh, please, please keep cats inside. Um, I, 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 I appreciate cats. Uh, but cats really do kill a lot of birds, they do. Um, and so it, it's, it's just, I, I'd be remiss not to mention it. <laughs> um, and so as I kind of finish up, I wanted to prime everybody with some things that you can do to continue to expand your knowledge base. Uh, I know that today's talk, um, we didn't really focus on bird ID. We focused on the habitat side. Um, maybe a, another another engagement would be a, a bird ID walk, although we'll do a little bit of that as we go at the Merck Forest Walk. Um, but books are always the tried and true. So there's several guides out there that I recommend. I like the, I like the Peterson's Guide myself. Um, eBird, or excuse me, I should say allaboutbirds.org from Cornell is just amazing. Like you can connect with all the resources that I mentioned up here tonight about thinking about feeders, thinking about uh, you know uh, the feeder watch program and whatnot. Uh, but they have an extensive uh, archive of bird identification and natural history information uh, on this website, and they also have it captured in an amazing app. Uh, I heard a lot of people just exclaiming about the Merlin app last year, and for good reason. I mean, it, it, uh, it's free for, to download on your smartphone, and it, uh, it will, with reasonable accuracy, not perfect, but it, it will allow you to actively record birds singing around you, and it'll help identify those birds in real time, which is really cool. I would suggest using it to get a feeling for what the, the bird you're hearing could be, and then you try to track that bird down and identify it and validate it. Um, but this is an amazing tool, and I encourage everybody to think about downloading Merlin and using it. So, in summary, I haven't belabored the point enough. Uh, diversity, diversity, diversity. Thinking about trying to keep everything as diverse as possible in, in the forest. Um, trying to avoid monocultures or uniformity. Uh, realizing that messy is good is important. Um, the value of maintaining our intact forested landscapes across Vermont. 
the elements of habitat, food, water, shelter, space, and assembly, which we all need, and we need that, birds need that at different scales and in different ways. Uh, I, it probably came through, but I didn't explicitly say it, but probably the biggest thing you can do is get to really know your property and get to know uh, what's going on in your property, walk it, hang out, spend time outside, getting, you know, just be it. It starts by being an active observer and thinking about what's going on, thinking about what resources exist to help support your values, and uh, just being aware of changes over time. So being an active observer is really important. Uh, beware of invasive plants, avoid them. Once they get on your land, it's really hard to get them off. Uh, I'm jumping around here, but also think about, you know, if you've got forested property, there's a lot of consulting foresters out there uh, to help you think about, you know, sort of culturally how to manage your property. There's also folks like myself that offer technical assistance in thinking about managing the forest on your property. Um, and then from there, you know, I mentioned the apps, I mentioned beware, you know, beware outdoor cats, windows, pesticides, and whatnot as nature hazards in, in the yard. So as I get to the very end here, I wanted to throw out, I'm kind of testing out this new thing, um, or this new mode of get, getting you guys information without printing it out. But here, if you want to take a photo of this, uh, I just want to put out uh, a resource. First and foremost, this QR code will take you to woodsandwildlife.org, which is the Woods, Wildlife, and Warbler website. So the Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers is our, our container program for our technical assistance work that we do with landowners. It's a partnership between Audubon, Vermont, and the Vermont Woodlands Association. Uh, and then there's other organizations like Vermont Coverts that offer trainings to landowners and peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. Uh, as well as other organizations. I mentioned Our Vermont Woods is a great resource that kind of puts, puts together all of the different resources that exist for landowners across the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'll take a moment to explain the QR code. So basically you take a photo, and then when you open up the photo, uh, your phone will try, it will automatically kind of hone in on that code and that code will tr will give you an option of just like opening up your browser to go to that web page. No. So not yeah, you don't have to go to the, the, the browser right now, but suffice to just take a photo of it right now. <coughs> and then almost last, uh, we we have our owl walk coming up, uh, owl prowl and woods walk. Basically, we're going to walk around Merck Forest, which I, I don't think I mentioned. I worked at Merck Forest for about three years as their conservation manager and ecologist. Uh, and I helped design the forest management work that has recently been done there and will continue to be done. So I'm excited to take folks around uh, the trail systems around the farm and talk about various treatments that we did and why we did that, them and kind of compare and contrast how these help courses respond over time and talk about these com components in person. No doubt we'll see some resident birds along the way, even though it'll be late in the day. And believe it or not, the last time I held one of these walks, we did see an owl. There's no guarantee, uh, but we did. <laughs> uh, I'm also going to be doing a, an online webinar where I'm gonna be diving into these concepts a bit uh, deeper through BWA, and that'll be online. Uh, the QR code, the top one will take you to the registration for that. And that'll also have a field walk component at Merck Forest as well. I've been doing a lot of work across the state of Vermont in the last year and a half, and I'm working to really bring a lot of focus to this part of the state because, well, I, you keep coming out and I'll keep telling you why. <laughs> uh, I, I will just say really briefly that we live in a very high priority connectivity, like part of Vermont in terms of our, the connection that our region maintains between the Green Mountains and the Taconics, or, or the Hudson Islands, I should say, and the Taconics. And we have one of the largest high priority forest blocks right here. Um, and 
to my knowledge, not a whole lot of landowner technical assistance work is being done here like it's being done in other parts of the state. So I'm really excited to, in these talks, as well as another one I'm going to give on April 4th um, to the Dorset community, which I don't have details set up here, but in that engagement as well, I'm just excited to keep talking with our community about these things. And I told a partner I would pitch their, their talk as well. Um, for good reason, uh, Vermont Coverts is, uh, they're, they're, they're based out of Virgins, but they, they've got a couple of trainings coming up. One of which is at, uh, right on the edge of uh, Lake Bombazine at Kehoe. So Coverts is doing a great thing and uh, I wanted to promote them as well. Cool. And so with that, oh wow, yeah. I'm a little bit over. It's awesome. So thank you all so much for your time and attention. I gave a lot to you, and I'm excited to hear any questions you have and talk about them. Yeah. What time does your follow up start? That should be at uh, 5, 5? 5, 5.30. 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, yeah, is it 5.30? 5.30. 5.30, yeah. Yeah. I guess I didn't put the time on there. Yeah, it's at 5.30. Thank you, Reese. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that it would be better to open the brush fog fields if you want to maintain its fields once a year late in the fall. But I found that doing that over the years has created a monoculture of, of um, the clothing. And I've been advised that it's better to to try to break up that monoculture by brush hogging like twice a year for a while. How does that work? Yeah. Uh, I haven't I haven't explicitly thought about the goldenrod or how it can turn into a monoculture. Um, so I guess the be the best thing I can say is that you can I mean, certainly you want diversity, right? So it's like two competing interests right there. It's like you want diversity, which the guidance that you've received is to, to get that diversity is to mow it twice a year. Uh, I can say that to avoid disturbing birds, it would be ideal if you mowed it in the like early spring and then late fall, kind of avoid that middle season if you could. Uh, maybe, maybe you... Sac, you know, call it a sacrificial year where you mow it twice to get the to deter the goldenrod, and then once the goldenrod has kind of, or I should say, other species have, have started to come back, then when it's at a place you like it, then you you do it every other year, assuming the goldenrod hopefully doesn't take over again. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, though. If I may, yeah, more that um, that when you show these um these young forests that are in Vermont, is there any way we can speed up the process of these becoming more diverse, not old, but old-like forests? Yeah, so that's, to, yeah, to accelerate old forest development, it really can only happen through active forestry. Uh, so a, a lot of what I do is actually advocating for, yeah, advocating for or empowering with the knowledge uh, among landowners and foresters how to go about through forestry, meaning through manipulating forests through strategic timber harvests, uh, how to restore those old forest conditions. Be, and, and it really comes down to using forestry as a tool to emulate natural disturbance. So thinking about, you know, um, a lot of what we think about, the work that I kind of prescribe is uneven age management, meaning it's it's not like just clear cutting landscapes. It, it is about how you select what we call single trees or groups of trees that can create a canopy gap or emulate like a microburst. You know, and along the way, the landowner could maybe get some money from the forest products released through that management to offset the cost of the management. Maybe they just get some firewood, or maybe they just leave the, the wood in the forest to decompose, but they're artificially kind of accelerating the development of, for of forests through disturbing those forests. 
reports or logging. <coughs> That's one way to do it, and it's, again, not one size fits all. Uh, there are certainly forests in Vermont that are already on a trajectory or are in an old forest condition, or there's certainly areas of Vermont where they're sensitive enough that it makes no sense to have anybody in there manipulating the forest. But it is something that, uh, by and large, landowners can think about doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Does does Oregon and Vermont have a list serve that disseminates a lot of the information that you mentioned, like those three items? Uh, and if there is such a thing, how does one get up? <laughs> yeah. So if you go to uh, woodsandwildlife.org, we do have. If you go to this website, woodsandwildlife.org, we do have a, a an email sign up where I distribute, right now it's bi-monthly, but I do, uh, we write articles and offer information to folks on all these concepts. So we do have a landowner group. Yeah. Okay, then another question is, does Audubon Vermont have any conservation land of its own? And where are all those places? Yeah, that's a great and question. Well, where, what would be a thing to look up? Yeah, so we've got a center in Huntington, Vermont, Green Mountain Audubon Center, and we have about 250 acres there of forests, as well as some fields, an active sugar bush, um, and education center. And, and yeah, if you go to uh, btaudubon.org, uh, you can you can find the center and go and please visit us. And it's also right next door door to the Birds of Vermont Museum, uh, so you can visit both. Birds of Vermont Museum has got an amazing collection of of hand carved birds. Yeah, no. John. Tim, thanks for the great talk. Wide ranging. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, if our birds, our native birds, are because of climate change migrating north, mm -hmm. we must be losing some of them. But aren't there birds in the south of Vermont that are migrating north and we're getting new species that we've never seen before? Can you mention some of those that you've noticed that are becoming more common in Vermont? For sure. Yeah. I, uh, first one that comes to mind is, uh, well, Northern Cardinal is an example of a bird that is, is moving north. Uh, it, it's largely, I mean, it's both climate change as well as land use change because they do well in, in like more urban landscapes and fragmentation. But another one uh, that stands out to me is like the red-bellied woodpecker. So I remember in 2006, I was freshman at UVM and I saw red-bellied woodpecker at my house in Benson, Vermont, Southern Champlain Valley. And looked it up and was like, wow, this is kind of an uncommon bird. And I told my professor Al Strong there about it. And he's like, yeah, birds can move into Vermont. And since then, it is, it's, all, it's all the way up there. You know, it is in my, in my career, in the last 15 years, it has moved um, very far north in Vermont. And not too long ago, it wasn't here. Uh, so that's another bird that, that certainly comes to mind. Eastern Toey is another bird, right? That uh, one one of our thrushes, um, just like Robin, and we've got them here, and no doubt they're moving north as well. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Well, we live up on the edge of the Green Mountain National Forest, and we've noticed a lot of owls during the day. We've been up there for like 26 years, but this time of year and going back about three weeks we've started to see them during the day yeah. what could that be attributed to three weeks uh just in the last week, three weeks you've seen a pick up an activity yes. yeah yeah it's it's no it's breeding season for them right now so they're they're out you know making maintaining territories and and vocalizing and um it, yeah, the breeding season stimulates them to be much more active. Yeah. yeah. 
So if you are asking what you see, I saw a um, snow owl in a tree mm -hmm. near my home, and it was huge. Well, I watched it to see how long it was going to stay there because I was, you know, I had a ready area for them. I know the predators and I had a lot of work for that. Mm -hmm. So I stopped doing that for a while. But then, uh, so that was in the middle of February, and a little bit later, I think I saw four snowy owls in the same day. Was that a mirage? Or did that really happen? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, it could happen. Uh, you know, it's certainly really being. Uh, for, for, for large predators like that, occupying the same space isn't as, as common as, as I would think otherwise. But, you know, it, um, it's not so out. We're about three feet apart. And, you know, like the little yeah. thing. Yeah. And it said that sometimes they migrate together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I said, okay, goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. But um, does that really happen? You know, sometimes when I find Google, I'm not sure. It's yeah, I, in general, birds do group up, especially during migration, and especially during the winter time. Uh, it is, uh, it's a safety in numbers kind of thing. They also, it's also a divide and conquer kind of thing. So they, they will, blue jays are a great example of this, that uh, when winter hits, resources become slim, they'll kind of all, hang together and search out food together. So, you know, more eyes, the better. Uh, so it's, especially in the winter time, it's, it's kind of common to have birds hang out together as opposed to the breeding season where they want to be apart because they have nothing to gain from hanging out together. They, they want to defend their own territories and resources. Yeah. Well, lucky you, you got to see some snowy owls. Yeah, huge predators. And they, they come down in large numbers in years where the lemming population can is quite low. Admittedly, I don't know offhand if this is one of those years, but pretty special birds. I see what they're getting out of the eastern blooper. It was not in my house for years. I had put up a, a, a blooper house. In the first couple of years, nothing. Then we had one, another one. And now this winter, ten to twenty bluebirds regular. Yeah. But I think it's what we were just saying that in the winter they they fly. Yep. And then they'll spread out during the breeding season. Exactly. And you know, bluebirds are an example of uh, they're actually a resident bird, uh, and yet our resident birds we're finding that they're actually more migratory than we ever realized. And, and it's been a mild winter, right? So very well our bluebirds, I'm just hypothesizing, but very well our, our bluebirds were inclined to stick around more this year than they, they would have in other years because it was basically like perpetual spring this winter, right? So. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question about uh, the bluebirds. Uh, so um, invasive plants, mm -hmm. sumac, the blueberry Yeah, yep. It, uh, it, it's a native, it's a native plant, uh, but it could be considered invasive in its growing habit and that it grows like such a yeah, you know, yeah. dense like patch. Um, so it's, it's easy to mix up the terms, but in general, like I, I love sumac, you know, it's, 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 well, I always dislike sumac. But not anymore. It's fair. <laughs> I collected the red berries yes. and I put them on the top of my feeder, and that attracted bluebirds. Perfect. Here. And, and I just, I'm like, I want birds to make everywhere. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I commend you for, for uh, sticking it out and coming around to the benefit of that, that plant. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, the berries in them, and the insects in those berries, too. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, it reminds me not being very hard earlier because we had, I think I still have a tree that split. Yeah. They, they split one of those heirloom resources. 
and I make them move different logs mm -hmm. in different parts of yeah. the yard. Yeah. And I have taken them my neighbor's trees while I'm down in their lot, but they can move in my yard. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing everything you're saying, and everyone is fine doing it. And he's learned that I'm not totally racist. Good. Validating that. Good. Good. <clears throat> and we have birds. Yeah. Uh, we have an acre of corn. Yeah. But on the even corns. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.